Hello and welcome to another short video for the 12 Lead ECG I've got the Rhythm Facebook group. In this case study we will be looking at a patient that presented with atypical symptoms and an ECG that clearly meets ST elevation criteria. A call was received by the ambulance service for a male in his 50s who was given as unconscious. A solo response car was activated first and on their arrival the patient was now alert on the AVPU scale and had a GCS of 15. Their presenting complaint was of being generally unwell and the family reported a five minute episode of the patient being unresponsive with abnormal breathing. They also state the patient had been unwell for several weeks with vomiting for three to four days about two weeks ago and since then he has felt weak, lethargic and not eating or drinking particularly well. The patient complained of pain in his legs and his feet and also mentioned some ongoing pain in his back but he denied any chest pain. He did say for the last three days he'd had been a bit short of breath. The patient's observations were taken and a 12 lead ECG recorded which can be seen here. His initial OBS were a respiratory rate of 24, pulse rate of 84 on regular, oxygen saturations of 96 to 97 percent on room air and a blood pressure of 95 over 58. His temperature was 36 degrees and he returned a blood glucose of 8 millimoles. So what are your initial thoughts looking at this ECG? Well, the first responder probably had the same thoughts you've just had and called this a STEMI. There is obvious ST elevation in the anterior leads, which could quite easily be described as tombstoning in appearance. And we have ST elevation in the inferior leads of 3 and AVF and some reciprocal ST depression in the lateral leads of 1, AVL, V5 and V6. And even the computer is reading this as an ST elevation MI. Now, remember, we said this was an atypical presentation and it also turned out to be a very challenging call. Under normal circumstances, a patient with an ECG like this would be loaded into the ambulance and the patient would be conveyed with a pre-alert call to the nearest cath lab. In this case study, however, the patient complicated matters by refusing to go to hospital. So why could that be? Well, that takes us back to the atypical presentation. The history and presenting complaint were not those we would usually associate with a patient having a large MI. So is there something else going on here? Well, if we think of a differential diagnosis, could it be an electrolyte problem here and possibly hyperkalemia? Those familiar with Professor Amal Matu's teachings in cardiology will know he describes hyperkalemia as the syphilis of ECGs in that it is the great imitator of electrocardiography. But why? Well, potassium, as we know, is vital for regulating electrical activity of the heart. And when it moves out of the cells, it affects both the pacemaking and conduction systems by reducing myocardial excitability. And this can result in the changes that we then see on the ECG. But what are those changes? Well, they can be many and varied, hence the syphilis tagline used by Professor Matu. On the left here, we have listed some of the changes that might expect to be seen depending on the level of hyperkalemia in a person. And on the right, we also have the definitions used for hyper-K. Although seven is considered severe, a level of over nine causes cardiac arrest, and that could be due to asystole, VF, or even a PEA with a bizarre and wide complex rhythm. Back to our ECG then, and let's look a little closer, thinking about the changes often seen with hyper-K. And what supports that as the cause here? Well, it is slightly irregular with a rate of around 78 and it has extreme axis with the computer reading this as minus 94 degrees. Intervals aren't quite right, though, as the computer reads the PR interval as 0.18 milliseconds. But I see this as slightly longer. So if we look at lead two, where the P waves actually appear to be, we can see that the PR interval is quite extended. Also, the computer reads the QTC as 0.441 milliseconds, and that is borderline long. The QRS complexes are not really wide, and the computer looks right with a reading of 0.108 milliseconds. But the morphology is bizarre in leads AVR, lead V1, and also in lead V2. But that's because the T wave is included within the complex. If we look across at leads V4, the T waves here, they look quite tall and peaked, but they're not really the sort of morphology that we would expect to be associated with hyper-K. You could be forgiven for thinking there is some bundle branch block morphology going. So if we look at the leads that we use for bundle branch block, so lead V1, lead V6, 
and also up here in lead one, we can see that the morphology there can be associated with a bundle branch block. So as we mentioned earlier, we can also see some ST segment changes with elevation in the anterior leads here and also in the inferior leads of three and AVF. And we've all got, also got reciprocal ST depression in the lateral leads of one and AVL and across here in V5 and V6. But these could even be described as de Winter type. So they've got upslope in ST depression of over one millimeter into a peak T wave. So is this a pseudo ACS? Well, here we have the patient's next ECG, which was recorded after a long delay on scene because of the nature of the event. At this point, the patient had deteriorated enough for the crew to act in their best interest and remove them for transport to the cath lab. And we can certainly see some dramatic changes. Just look at those T waves now that are quite acute and peaked. We've also got a computer interpretation now that also prompts for consideration of hyperkalemia. On arriving at the cath lab, a discussion was had as to the calls being electrolyte versus STEMI. And all things taken into account, the management plan was to, not to undertake PPCI, but instead to check the patient's bloods. The results of which returned a potassium reading of over eight, which we know is very high. And treatment was commenced to reduce this and manage the levels back to normal. During the patient's management, he also had a run of VTAC, which we have a short rhythm strip recorded here. The rate is shown as 156, but it was reported at over 200 at one point. Ultimately though, this patient received the treatment he undoubtedly needed, and as he improved, was able to thank the staff involved in his care. Some take home points from this case study then. Always consider hyper-K, particularly when the history is suggestive of an electrolyte imbalance or the patient has an atypical presentation. Remember it can produce many and varied changes to the ECG and pseudo-ACS is just one example. Expect your patient to deteriorate unless the cause of their potassium imbalance is treated and wherever possible, continuous monitoring of your patient is a must. It just remains for me to credit and thank my colleagues Karina, Gracie and Michelle for their participation in the care of this patient and also to thank you for watching. Hopefully you found this case study both interesting and helpful. From the 12 Lead ECG, I've got the Rhythm Facebook group. Bye for now.